Thank you. I understand that for many people, exams and President Obama are probably more important than this talk. I so I, you doubt it. <laughs> but I thank you for turning out today on a very cold evening. We had 26 inches of snow one day in Colorado three weeks ago, so I, I know you're waiting for years. Um, I'd love to give you some of ours. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the future we want. And um, I did frame the discussion a little bit, but let me reframe it. I'm going to talk about three things. First of all, the climate problem. I consider climate change to be the mother of all sustainability issues, and by implication, I'm talking about sustainable development. Secondly, I want to talk about some new ways of thinking about the climate problem, ways that I wish Congress would think. And thirdly, uh, a little bit about changing the national conversation about climate change. And as you all know, this is the moment to talk about this. I'm on my way to Copenhagen, as are about 30,000 other people, where uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, climatic international talks are supposed to occur and probably won't in terms of reaching an international deal. But I think we will see some exciting things happen in Copenhagen. So it's a good moment to talk about this. And this is what, of course, climate change is all about. All of you have seen Al Gore's presentation, I'm sure, and seen this slide. This is the atmosphere. Uh, about the equivalent of a coat of varnish on a basketball, very frail, very thin, uh, and very vulnerable to CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So this is what we're talking about right here is the frailty of this system upon which our life depends, of course. And uh, through all the uh, esoterica of climate science that we've heard over the past uh, many years, um, these are basically the messages that scientists are trying to project to us. Global warming is real. It's underway right now. It's caused mostly by human activities, the damage is already significant. It's already underway here in the United States, as well as in Greenland and other parts of the world. If we allow it to go much farther, it's going to be disastrous and in some cases irreversible. We have the tools to prevent this, but we don't have a lot of time, and we stand at a crossroads between two futures. And I'll discuss that a little bit more uh, down the road here. Um, for evidence that climate change already is underway, this is a map that was produced perhaps five or six years ago, showing at that point in time where around the world the first signs of climate change were uh, visible. It could have been sea level rise, drought, uh, extreme weather events, any number of uh, manifestations of climate change. But it's been around for some time. Um, and it's beginning to show up here in the United States. It was last year that federal climate scientists declared for the first time that uh, they were convinced uh, the evidence showed climate change is underway in the United States in many different ways. Um, the goals that we need to reach, according to science and, um, and uh, some parts of the international community, is that we need to stabilize global emissions, not just developing country emissions, but global emissions by 2015. A huge, huge challenge, of course. And we need to cut emissions in the developed countries 25 to 40 percent by 2020. And that's compared to a 1990 baseline. And without getting too much into the weeds, uh, that's an important distinction. Those of you who've watched uh, Congress act on this saw a historic piece of legislation come out of the House of Representatives, first climate bill ever to be passed by other house of, either House of Congress. It called for a 17% reduction by 2020, but compared to a 2005 base year, that's the equivalent of a 4% reduction or thereabouts on a 1990 base year. So you can see we're well below, somewhere between a fifth and a tenth of what the world community and the science community says developing nations ought to do. How fast we should go, just uh, in the past couple of years, we were told by leading climate scientists and uh, international officials that we had just a couple of years to solve this problem. So it can quickly get away from us, and that's the sense of urgency that I hope I can convey. We really need to deal with this now. It's a disappointment that uh, Obama and other leaders say we won't reach a, a, a seal the deal, so to speak, in Copenhagen, but we need to soon thereafter. We just don't have time to waste. You can see we're headed in the wrong direction. This is a chart that depicts um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions by country between 1990 and 2030. And the big red band in the middle is China. You can see it's responsible in this projection for the fastest growth, but so are uh, other developing nations. And that's where the, most of the growth in carbon emissions is going to occur. And of course, the big challenge here is to meet the millennial development goals, solve extreme poverty by 2025 without destroying the life support systems on which prosperity in our lives depend. Huge challenge. Um, we've known about this for some time. The first president I found uh, evidence had been uh, warned about climate change by his science advisors was Lyndon Johnson uh, some time ago in 1965, and we've done very little about it since then. Um, the great divide that we face right now is to close the gap between what scientists say we need to do and what politicians say that we can do, what they can do. Um, the huge influence being exerted by the fossil energy industries right now to prevent any meaningful action on climate change and to allow them to continue profiting from pollution without paying for it. Uh, and that can't continue. But it's a huge gap we need to close. And I love this quote from Winston Churchill because it describes very well where we are right now. 
Um, I, we have exhausted all other possibilities. I hope we've arrived at the point now where we will do the right thing. Uh, that remains to be seen. Um, this is a moment of change. And President Obama, when he was elected, even before he was elected, realized this. Rahm Emanuel, his, um, his um, whip, I guess, on Congress, recognizes this. We are in a crisis, not only a climate crisis, but many others. And that signifies that systems are breaking. And that's a time where we can, uh, we can redo them and, and really start a new beginning. Uh, President Obama is, uh, well, I won't talk much about it. He hasn't quite lived up to this promise yet, but he certainly recognizes the opportunity. And I think we all need to support him living up to this promise. So we face, uh, as they say, a paradigm shift. Um, can we make this shift into a 21st century economy, a new energy economy, a low carbon economy, uh, whatever we want to call it? I'll discuss in a minute uh, what that all means. But we need the shift right now. Um, I want to talk now about new ways of thinking about this. When you listen to the congressional debate or even the debate in the public arena, people are talking about the wrong things. Um, they we're talking, for example, about can we get more gas, more oil, more coal out of reserves here in the United States, make ourselves more energy independent. But the limiting factor isn't how much carbon is in the ground, it's how much we can put in the sky now. That's what we should be talking about, not how much reserves we have, how many hundreds of years or dozens of years we have of oil and coal and so on. If oil addiction is bad, why do we continue to subsidize it? Much to his credit, President Obama proposed to the G20 just a couple of weeks ago that we stop subsidizing fossil fuels worldwide, or in the G20 nations anyway. The G20 embraced that goal. The staff is working up the details. We'll see whether the details are good. But we need to stop subsidizing the wrong things and divert that money into the right things. We can't end an addiction to oil by switching suppliers. This means that whether we get it here or we get it there, we got to stop depending on it and move to cleaner fuels. Another thought, an abundance of a resource is not a mandate to consume it. I hear all the time in Appalachia and other places that we have hundreds of years of coal. It's cheap around the world. It's inevitable that it's going to be used. I don't think that's necessarily true. The best use of coal is to leave it in the ground. I think there are substitutes that can uh, end our reliance upon it. Uh, it is, there's no mandate to use it simply because it exists. And uh, all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this old saw uh, from a uh, Saudi Arabian oil minister that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. We found a better, better way, and that's going to be true with coal. And if supply and price is the criteria, what about the sun? We have a 7 billion year supply. It's delivered eight minutes for free, and it has zero carbon emissions. If those are our criteria, we should be using this thing. Another new thought, the cost of doing nothing is much greater than the cost of doing something. Uh, we hear all the time about raising energy prices in the middle of recession, how much this is going to cost us to solve this problem. Well, it's minuscule right now compared to the cost we're going to face in a society that's plagued by spreading disease, by drought, by famine, uh, and by world economy. I mean, that's uh, plagued with all those problems, extreme weather events like we saw in Katrina. That will be a very expensive society. And we need to engage, engage right now in risk management. We need to minimize that risk and minimize those costs down the road because it's a heritage we cannot leave our children. There's a difference between problem switching and problem solving. We hear uh, about all the virtues of liquid from coal, for example, or oil shale or tar sands, making us more independent of Middle Eastern oil. Uh, we're simply switching problems when we do that because those options are terrible for water uh, supplies. They're terrible for carbon output. There are solutions that have very few problems attached to them, and we need to exhaust those solutions first, like energy efficiency and many forms of renewables, before we get into the more exo exotic and problematic Solution. So you'll hear the fossil industry dressing itself up in new clothes for a new 21st century, trying to be relevant with, through things like carbon capture and sequestration, when we really ought to be exhausting other options first, like energy efficiency. Smart technologies can't always compensate for stupid behavior. Um, and this refers to geoengineering. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about some very exotic geoengineering solutions um, where engineers, and if any of you are engineers, I apologize for this, but, and I understand it, are salivating at the challenge ahead to somehow control uh, uh, the effects of climate change. And for example, one option that I hear discussed is to deploy uh, mirrors in space to reflect the sunlight, uh, which seems rather strange to me. Um, there's enough debris to break the mirrors, and every time we do, we have seven years of bad luck. It just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, but we need, once again, to exhaust the simpler, least cost solutions, I think, before we resort to these. I will say, however, that there's a widening circle of bad choices that many of my colleagues are accepting, and I fully understand it, like nuclear power, which is carbon-free at the moment of reaction, but not necessarily in the production chain. 
Uh, but more people that I didn't, wouldn't expect to embrace nuclear power two years ago now do. Jonathan Lash, for example, from the World Resources Institute. So we see people becoming more desperate for solutions as the crisis becomes greater, um, even though it, it's a crisis a little bit uh, and uh, we shouldn't resort to those solutions until we absolutely have to because we're problem switching again. And finally, if we insist on ruining the planet, we have to stop calling ourselves the most intelligent species. I think that should be a new, new rule. Um, what we're suffering right now, and this is where I want to turn to the idea of a national conversation and how it must evolve, I think, uh, is what uh, one author recently called apocalypse fatigue. We hear these scientific predictions, uh, uh, dire uh, consequences in civilization. We see in the media 2012 is the latest one, not climate related, just simply Mayan calendar related. But we see other movies like The Eleventh Hour, The Day After Tomorrow, Inconvenient Truth, that start out depicting uh, the apocalypse in front of us. Uh, what that can do, unless it's balanced by all, a, a corresponding vision of possibility, is give people a deer in the headlights kind of uh, syndrome, where they shut down and feel powerless to stop. Uh, the problem. And so we need to counteract that. And what's happening right now is a uh, slippage, and we're seeing this in many polls. This uh, is a Pew poll that was taken in October, but there's a new one out by, uh, I think it's ABC News and Washington Post, another one coming up very shortly. And they all show with slightly different numbers that public belief in uh, climate change is slipping a bit, uh, belief in strong action to counteract climate change is slipping a bit. Um, and I, I some analysts say that this apocalypse fatigue is one factor that's causing that to happen. The economy is a distraction and so on, too. The one thing I want to point out in these polls, by the way, uh, the most recent one, I think, showed slippage from 80% last year to 72% this year of people who strongly believe in, in climate change being a problem. That means that three out of every four Americans still believe it's a big problem. Uh, so um, the reporting shows the slippage, but we actually still have a very strong majority of Americans who believe we need to act on this. Uh, this is another look at that same poll um, where 44% of Americans uh, polled in last year said that they believe this is a very serious problem down to 35% today. So we need to counteract that slippage. This is a quote from Ted Nordhaus and Michael Schellenberger about this uh, apocalypse fatigue and how people will back away uh, from science and from belief in the problem if it becomes too formidable in their minds. Um, and I want to give you an example. And this is going to be awkward because I'm not sure quite how to do this um, without switching back like this. But here's an example of, uh, of what we see in the media, and you've all seen these, I'm sure. Industrial civilization has caused irreparable damage. Our political and corporate leaders have consistently ignored the overwhelming scientific evidence. Not only is it the 11th hour, it's 11.59. What we saw with Katrina is just prologue. Worse is yet to come. We need to balance it also with visions of possibility because there are opportunities still in this change, big opportunities. And we need to give the American people, I think, some hope. In fact, people around the world. Here's another one I won't bother to show you, but the, you'll see in the news media also the visions of climate impacts in the United States. This one uh, in Texas during the hurricane recently, the wildfires in the West, which were, uh, are generating more heat and destruction. Uh, than firefighters have ever seen before. Here's the pine bark beetle destruction going on in Colorado and other points west where whole forests are disappearing and turning into timber. It's an absolute tragedy. Uh, partly related to climate change, warmer winters that don't kill those beetles. Uh, extreme weather events, um, flooding like this. We see these images. And the, the, the message here is that climate change is here and it's now and it's personal. It's not a remote thing we can put off for our children and their children or t for other countries. It's something we need to deal with here and now. And we, of course, see other images of collapse that I mentioned earlier, the economic collapse, the housing market, and so on. So the problem with these negative visions, if they're left alone and not balanced to some extent, is, uh, is they, uh, we, we can produce the tragedy we're afraid of. So we need to be careful uh, about uh, seeing both sides of the coin and, and the power of positive vision, which we have not yet begun to tap. So we've proposed tapping it. Uh, based on a 1939 uh, exhibition at the Expo at the World's Fair, uh, Futurama, done by General Motors in the depths of a depression, uh, where it showed people in a sort of Disney-esque fashion before Disney existed, what uh, 1960 or thereabouts would look like, a fabulous, uh, sparkling vision of a car-centered society. And it was so provocative, apparently, that we're still investing in that society 70 years later. Uh, but GM used the best available communications technologies to give people hope at a time where things were rather desperate. And we need to do that again. We need a new vision. We've got marvelous new uh, technologies that General Motors never dreamed of to convey that vision. And we need to do it. So 
Michael Northup of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and I convened a conference last April of these organizations and people to talk about what we might do. Uh, one of the things that resulted from this, in part, was a, a campaign by Ogilvy & Mather, a big global advertising firm that represents Ford and Coca-Cola and British Petroleum and Siemens and Unilever and many others, hired by the United Nations to uh, engage the world's youth in uh, pressing for bold climate action. And they launched a campaign called Hope and that I've been somewhat involved in, um, rallying youth around the country to sign a petition and do other things to press for results uh, at Copenhagen. Um, I'm not going to show you that one. It's not that exciting. Uh, but it was a people's campaign, not a United Nations campaign. Uh, the United Nations didn't uh, put its name on this, so it wouldn't be identified with it. The idea was to connect people around the world. Uh, so they changed the name of the city of Copenhagen to Copenhagen, uh, changing from Cope to Hope. And the city of uh, Hopen uh, Copenhagen embraced this, and I'll show you in a moment what they're going to do in December. Uh, but here is some of the artwork that the creative team at Ogilvy and Mather put together to appeal to world youth about getting engaged in this problem. Billboards around the world are showing this campaign. This one in Paris, obviously. A website where uh, citizens of, Co of Copenhagen, uh, about 400,000 right now, can uh, actually get the virtual passports and have them stamped for taking personal action. Uh, the kids with the most stamps are being sent to Copenhagen for two weeks by uh, Ogilvy and Mather to become delegates of the country of Copenhagen. These are more uh, signs of the website. And when the delegates arrive at the airport in Copenhagen, they'll see this kind of signage. At the airport, on the highways. <laughs> All right. So that's what Ogilvy and Mather is doing, and it's, uh, it's, it's one of the signs, and I see several, uh, that we're at a moment where we need to be talking about the future we can create. And so as a result of this April conference, we'll go back to that, we created another proposal to build an exhibit with the Chicago Field Museum that will travel around the world uh, with a companion website uh, filled with computer animations, which I hope to show you examples of in a moment. This is a depiction of the uh, exhibit. People will walk up to these you know, very large, uh, high-definition images and be able to zero in from an aerial view that shows how it all fits together, how smart grid ties into a, a solar farm in the country, ties into uh, green buildings in the city. Then they can zoom in, like you see on this left panel uh, over here, uh, on a closer speed level view. And from there, they can click on everything down to green refrigerators and get videos that show what those are. So they can begin to understand what the future might be like in their homes, in their transportation systems, neighborhoods, and cities. So these are different views of uh, this exhibit. It ends with a fulfillment station where people can order materials to their own email address, can vote on what they saw, can express their preferences for the future, and so on. Next steps is that fulfillment station. So we're looking for funding to do that. Hope to do it soon. This is a closer view of the big screens I'll walk up to, and you can see the, uh, the little push screen here where they can uh, zero in and look at green features. And we see images around the world of, of green shoots arising. This is actually a system that's going in this fall. It should be done now at Heathrow Airport in London. Uh, little transportation pods that hold four people called an ultra system uh, that move them in computer uh, guided ways to where they need to go very, very quickly. It's a very cool system, an alternative to vehicle traffic uh, at the airport. And here is where I have a brand new video I want to try to show you. Uh, it's a composite of some of the video animations that a colleague of mine uh, has done, a guy named Jonathan Ardle. It gives you an example of what we're going to try to do to depict green technologies. This is the city of Kansas City. Jonathan did a tutorial for public television on what mass transit would be. City in terms of growth patterns, here's higher density growth popping up in the future due to mass transit, light rail. And here Jonathan has, has imagined what light rail would look like in a street. And in a moment you'll see how he's combined actual video of real people with this future. Here on the right, you see actual video. Can you hear me on this thing? OK. We need to populate this future with real people so they get a sense of it being lived in. This is done by AREP, a different group showing algae growth on skyscrapers, algae farming in urban settings. This, and we're going to jump back and forth to this one, is, uh, well, we'll skip that. Here's PV on building sides. 
All right, this picture you saw of an actress a moment ago is Jonathan has inserted a real actress into a totally imaginary high density of uh, condo development in downtown Dallas, Texas. He did this for the developer to show the customers what it would be like to live in these units and how high density can be pleasant. And to me, it's a seamless, wonderful example of how you can populate a, 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 an image of the future that you've created out of your imagination. So these are the kind of things you want to do. In fact, we've asked President Obama to step into the future at the beginning of, of our website and beginning of the exhibit uh, because we can have him walk right into one of these neighborhoods and have us all follow him in. I'll let this play off. There's just a couple of more images. This is um, Manchester, England. And what we're trying to do here is show kind of a linear progression to the future. Uh, we need a transformative change, but people need to see we can get there from here. So you see retrofits going on here of a very old community in England. So that's it. The uh, website is a, a companion to this, and we're going to, on the website, allow people to actually vote on the future and help create it so that they feel part of designing it, which we found in past experience is a good thing to do because if they feel they own it, they'll fight for it. So we need to, to seize the moment. We need to capture the power of positive vision as well as the reality of the negative visions that uh, are coming upon us. Uh, there are some very authoritative figures who've said we need this kind of vision unless uh, we want to perish. And one of them is Martin Luther King. And this is a quote I love about the fierce urgency of now, which I'll, I'll let you read on your own if you can. We can't be one of those civilizations who says uh, it was too late. And one uh, last point I want to make is that uh, although we invested a lot of hope in our leaders, including President Obama, who is uniquely talented to bring this kind of change about, it's not up to him. And in effect, if President Obama were standing here, I think he'd probably say, uh, make me do this. I really want to, but make me do this. Uh, we all need to get involved. We all need to push our leaders to be bolder than they are right now um, because of this. And that's my presentation. Thank you. How about making us do something? by an energy tax. Yeah. I'd go for that. But uh, uh, it's one of those three-letter words that we uh, don't see uh, Congress have the courage to deal with. Um, there are much more direct ways to uh, put a price on carbon than a cap-and-trade system. Uh, if, one of the things, by the way, speaking of alternatives, that uh, uh, we're pushing President Obama to do is make much stronger use of EPA's regulatory authority to leverage congressional action. Uh, I would love to see him say, we are designing an architecture, a regulatory architecture, to achieve a 20% reduction in 2020 compared to 1990. And I invite Congress to do that through a market mechanism. And if you can, we won't regulate. And if you only get halfway there, we'll regulate the other half. But that's our national goal. He's got the executive authority to do that. And if Republicans want to take that authority away, they're going to have to muster the 60 votes in the Senate to do it. So I, you know, I, we're pushing for that kind of thing. But I think a tax would be a very direct way to do this. Uh, they, what people say about the tax and the arguments about cap and trade versus tax is that a cap and trade is a more assured limit on emissions. I mean, it's based on a, a defined limit where a tax is not. You can tweak the tax to try to reach that limit, but you don't have that definitive cap uh, that some people want. How do you think that we can abridge the time lapse between the implementation of these new energy technologies with um, the thing that many people I'm afraid don't realize is that we have a lot of off-the-shelf technologies available now that's certainly true of many forms of energy efficiency. We are somewhere around the 22nd least or most efficient country in the world. Um, our leaders should stand up and say that by 2020 we're going to be the most efficient economy in the world. And there are cost-effective off-the-shelf we all know about types of technologies that need to be implemented. And if we do, we're going to insulate ourselves from a carbon tax or from a carbon price. There's all this worry about us paying more for energy. Uh, and we may have to, but if we use energy efficiency to insulate ourselves from that shock, we won't have to. Um, or we can mitigate it largely. The other thing is that there's a lot of solar technologies. John and Nancy know about this so well um, out there that people don't talk about but are ready to go. Passive solar heating, orienting buildings in this kind of climate to the south. Um, studying the microclimate that your landscaping controls, the control breezes coming into your building, uh, you know, high efficiency windows. There's just solar water heating. There's so many things that are cost effective now that we just don't do. Uh, it's ridiculous we don't take advantage of the natural systems around us in, in our design. And to me, uh, uh, intellectual capital is just as valuable as financial capital when we design these things. 
I was involved in a project uh, this gentleman mentioned when he came in, he knows about it, in Wisconsin where we moved a village and built a solar town, moved it out of a floodplain in the late 1970s. Um, and we achieved 75% of the heat in these buildings in Wisconsin from passive solar systems. And the buildings cost no more than conventional construction in that part of the world at that time because they were brilliantly designed. Uh, in the fire hall, the tanker trucks were part of the thermal mass to hold the solar energy. In the grocery store, the can water in the canned goods was calculated as part of the thermal mass to reduce the cost in concrete. So we needed, you know, we have uh, intellectual capital is the first thing we should spend. So my answer is that there's a whole lot we can do uh, while other newer technologies are evolving. Uh, even photovoltaics, which is traditionally the high-priced one, is, is coming down uh, pretty quickly uh, to the point where um, the predictions are in the southwest it'll be a grid parity, it'll be effect, uh, competitive with coal by uh, within five years or so. We'll see if that happens. So we've got the technologies now to act, and the ones that we think are so exotic are maybe not that far away. Um, I like what you're trying to do where you're attempting to shape the sort of balance between the terror and the possibilities, um, the Copenhagen. Um, how could you take those ideas and focus them on the ruined landscapes and peoples of Appalachia? I think that um, to many people, and this is true of people in Appalachia as well as elsewhere, the idea of a, a, a low energy economy or a post coal economy, although we don't quite use that term in Appalachia, um, without flak vests on, uh, it, it is an abstraction. Uh, when President Obama says we need, need a new energy economy, that's an abstraction to most of us. Uh, I think the people of Appalachia can be engaged in an exercise like any of us to, to envision the future they want. Um, education systems, healthcare systems, uh, better highways to remove trash, uh, 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 bioremediation of coal slurry, all the things that they need to do. Show them visually what that world would look like. What world are they trying to do? Restored rural communities, restored buildings in rural communities, cultural respect, somehow you know, bringing back old architecture and other things. Um, get them engaged in envisioning that future and then uh, developing a roadmap to get to it. it. As you know, I've worked over the years with a lot of disaster affected communities, uh, with Bob Burkbaugh and others, and this is what we did. We went in and did charrettes over a weekend, had people uh, tell us what they treasured in their community, what they wanted in the future. We went off, uh, drew up some drawings, brought it back on Sunday morning, they critiqued them, and then we'd help them develop a plan. And it's amazing the excitement and energy and positive energy that happens in a group when you engage them in that kind of exercise. With, uh, and not a fantasy exercise, it's gotta be something that shows results. You can't stir up that kind of excitement and walk away. Uh, you know, you, you gotta, there's gotta be the possibility of actually creating the vision, uh, you know, materializing the vision that you're creating. Uh, that's one step. Um, we need to end the dynamic in Appalachia, for those of you who are familiar with it. They're really on the brink of violence there, I think. There's been some incidents of that between people who are doing civil disobedience now at uh, the mountaintop removal sites and the people whose families depend on coal jobs uh, who have been scared by uh, coal companies into thinking that their neighbors are trying to steal their livelihood. Um, we need to break, you stop that conversation and have a different one and, and try to get the people pulling together on creating a more diverse economy there. I think everyone can agree they need that. So our project is designed not to engage in the mountaintop removal debate. Um, that debate is important and it's going on, but to begin a different uh, or, or supplemental discussion about what we can all create that I think everyone there can agree on. So that's our strategy. And we think if we can do it in Appalachia, we can do it in any uh, fossil energy dependent region. We hope. Yes? Do yes, you see uh, biofuels uh, falling into place in the future? Well, um, Corn, no. Of course, um, cellulosic, possibly. Um, the one possible benefit I could see to carbon capture and sequestration it has to do with biofuels, but I actually don't think that's a technology that uh, we should be investing so much money in, carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and the reason is, uh, in, in terms of coal, I'll get back to your question, uh, it's going to take too long to develop it. If we can develop it, by the time we do, uh, electricity from coal will be at least twice as expensive as it is now while solar, wind, and other forms are coming down. So the money we're investing, the billions of dollars in carbon capture, we should be investing in utility-scale energy storage to store intermittent power. Biofuels, um, problematic. I mean, the, the trade-off that we all recognized about a year ago was uh, between cropland and uh, what carbon emissions were involved in tilling that cropland and the benefit we can get from biofuels. 
Um, I personally think there's other ways to get liquid fuels, um, and algae may be one of them. Uh, and so biofuels, in a sense, is one of those problem switching, although it's a better technology than some of the other terrible switches, it's still a problem switching option. Um, I think, by the way, that we uh, ought to be proposing a rural renaissance in this country to make rural America the primary source of our energy. And I mean solar farms, wind farms, carbon sequestration services through private forest management and tillage practices and on and on and on. Uh, ethanol production from landfills and animal waste. Uh, I think rural America could be our new breadbasket of energy and, and it's, a, it's a way to revitalize the rural parts of our country. Station's very strong here in Vermont. Yeah, we've got to do that. Uh, and in the Obama administration, they've begun, they sent a team out to do a rural tour uh, last summer uh, to go around talking about rural revitalization, but they haven't quite packaged it this way. And this is what I see lacking right now, is packaged visions, big visions, like becoming the most energy efficient country in the next 10 years, or a rural renaissance. We need that kind of framing for people to see the big picture. And we're getting little pieces, but we're not getting those brilliant packages that people will respond to. Uh, yeah, I just, I wondered what specific role you were hoping to play at Copenhagen. Um, a couple. I, I'm sitting the, in Copenhagen. They have breakout sessions that are called side events, and a lot of the NGOs sponsor these events around a whole variety of subjects. I'm going to be participating in a bunch of them. I'll be showing something like this in several of those side events. I also belong to a, a, a group that um, Mikhail Gorbachev has created uh, internationally to agitate for strong climate action, and um, he's conspiring me to get me into the high-level negotiations and blog about them. And I don't know whether that's going to happen, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping it will. If that happens, I'll be spending most of my time doing that. Um, uh, I also, one of the angles that's developing right now is the nexus between national security and risk management and climate change. And so there'll be several events around that topic that I'll participate in also. It'll be a busy two weeks. President Obama will be there on the 9th. He's having members of his cabinet give presentations every day during that first week on various aspects of U.S. Policy. I, I, I do want to say, to uh, the Obama administration's credit, it has amassed a pretty incredible historic record, actually, of action using his executive authority. It's not enough. There's more he can do. But they've done several things that are, are very, very consequential, like embracing the California vehicle emission standard, like uh, setting in motion EPA regulation, issuing a new federal executive order, the largest energy consumer in the country is the federal government. He's set aggressive new goals for, uh, for reducing energy consumption in the federal government, and on and on. Not to mention the team he's put together, taking the gag off of federal climate scientists and those kinds of things. So he's amassed a pretty good record, but uh, there's more he can do and he needs to do. On one hand, we've got a lot of effort going into branding uh, climate legislation and action in terms of green jobs. On the other hand, there's a lot of scare tactics about job loss uh, with climate legislation. So do you think it's an effective way? Are there better ways to do it? The green economy angle is a very good angle. Uh, the problem is that terminology picks up baggage so damn fast in Washington, D.C. that it becomes a liability, a good concept. Uh, it's, Washington's kind of the Paris of, of rhetoric. I mean, every year there's a whole new thing. So green jobs is not a favored term, I think, right now, but it's a very favored concept. And, and in fact, the United Nations Environment Program is engaged in something called the Global Green New Deal, uh, coming up with worldwide mechanisms to transfer technologies and some money into the developing world to develop green. Um, there, unemployment is here. When we talk about job losses, we've got steel workers doing nothing. We've got automakers doing nothing. We've got people with the skills to make solar panels and wind turbines doing nothing. Uh, I saw a presentation last week in Washington by the president of the, uh, the International Steel Workers Union, I believe it was, who said this. He wants to put his workers to work. And renewable energy, wind turbines, and solar, and other renewable technologies are the way to do it. He's, he knows for it. So we have unemployment. You know, we are in a transition. You know, whether we guide that transition or victims of that transition, we are in a transition. It's never been more clear that we're part of a global system. From the flu epidemic to the global meltdown, we are part of a global system. Uh, and uh, this jumps around. But one of my favorite quotes from years ago is from a UN uh, official named Rafael Salas, who's dead now. He said, in the years ahead, the most potent force will not be nuclear weapons, but uh, the aspiration bomb. It'll be the unfulfilled aspiration of billions of the world's people. That'll be the most explosive force in world affairs. We are in a transition, climatically and socially and economically. So th we, need to become, we need to become architects of it rather than victims of it. So I, the, the idea about job losses, we're experiencing those now. And we're going to continue to experience them as we go to peak oil and other problems with the current 
way we power our economies. Have I evaded your question well enough? Good. I guess. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier in your talk about uh, well-meaning people uh, going for nuclear power as a, as a solution to all this. Um, as you may know, we're trying to uh, shut down an aging nuclear power plant here in Vermont. And the concept is, uh, if we do, other sources of energy, mainly renewables, re replace it. But there's a lot of pushback that let's run this whole reactor because uh, it's cheap. Um, where, where do you see nuclear fitting into all this? And, and how do we work that? I'm not sure how you work it here. Uh, the way we've worked it nationally, or you know, the way we fudged the issue nationally, is say that to say that um, nuclear power may be great if you can solve the proliferation problem, the waste storage problem, and the vulnerability of the terrorist attack problem. And once you solve all those, then let's talk. So we haven't frontally opposed nuclear power. We've simply placed, con I think, reasonable conditions on its uh, on its uh, proliferation, on its spread. Um, if you, if you, if you, to talk about scary things, one of the things that Gorbachev is uh, excited about is, uh, is ridding the world of nuclear weapons again now that Obama has, has restated that goal. So Gorbachev has gotten energized around that. And one of the things we're talking about is the fact that you've got a confluence, a perfect storm of events. Uh, you've got spreading nuclear weapons. You've got record levels of arms sales, arming uh, all kinds of nations in volatile regions. You've got predictions of, uh, of uh, severe climate impacts in some of the most unstable regions of the world, creating millions of climate refugees crossing unfriendly borders from Bangladesh and India and so on. Um, uh, what else do you have? Uh, and you've got the prospect of peak oil, for example, um, all coming to a head at the same time. And we're bickering about the details of climate legislation. And, you know, it's kind of time to get on with it and get on to the next problem. But all of those things need to be dealt with. Uh, and nuclear power is a liability until we've dealt with those three problems. Uh, I personally believe and have uh, half a dozen studies that I consider more or less reputable that say we don't need it. That we could, with energy efficiency and cost-effective renewables, um, we don't need more nuclear power plants or more coal plants for that matter. Uh, the thing is we just haven't gotten to it. We need to take those things off the shelves and deploy them, I mean, saturate the market with those technologies before we get into the other stuff. More questions. This is fun. And you think that Copenhagen will be hoping will be anything more than an educational opportunity? What you're doing is an NGO thing. Yeah. Gorbachev is now out of office, so it's an NGO. Yeah. Uh, will there be any substantive stuff there, or is it just an educational opportunity? Well, um, I'm hoping that there's still a chance for substantive stuff. And the U.S. position going in is going to be this that what we need to reach at Copenhagen are national, verifiable national commitments for climate action, not an international treaty yet. They hope to achieve that in the next six to 12 months after Copenhagen. But they want to walk out of that two-week meeting with hard, uh, firm commitments by every nation uh, for, to reduce its carbon emissions or slow the growth in, them in the developing country's case. If they achieve that, that'll be a step forward. There's no question about that. Um, then the next trick is to do it internationally. Without an international agreement, you've got uh, trade problems. Uh, you know, the trade disadvantage to a, 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 a country that's not controlling its carbon emissions is supposed to be one of those. You really need an international regime. Uh, but Obama's given up that notion for this month and hopes to do that perhaps in Mexico City in December of 2010. Um, if, if we get national agreements, it'll be a step forward. I think you know, it'll be a tremendous embarrassment uh, to the international community and certainly to the United Nations if there is not material progress, concrete progress coming out of Copenhagen. And the question I asked myself, the political deadline, the embarrassment deadline was now, was December in Copenhagen. And we've let that slip by. So I'm wondering what the, what, uh, the leverage is now to force action after this December. I don't know. But anyway, I hope, I'm hopeful something useful will come out of it. So are those uh, videos that help you visualize what a green society might look like, are they on a website right now? Yes, they are. And what's that website? Uh, it's futurewewant.org. Uh, www.futurewewant.org. And you'll see samples of these videos. If you, um, I, I have business cards if you'd like. If you want uh, uh, more, I can send them to you. 
late seventies and early eighties in Burlington, there was a proposal for high-rise condos along the waterfront that a, a local developer uh, had retained uh, Ben Thompson, who had done Fannie Hall, Quincy Marketplace, and Baltimore Harbor, and so forth. And he had an option on that land. Land. I don't know if you've been down there, where the boathouse, where the park is, where Echo, the Rubenstein Ecosystem Lab, and so forth are. And basically, so Thompson had their architects and people do this really glitzy video showing how pretty it is. And it's basically a mini Miami, mini Acapulco, breaking the view. You wouldn't be able to, this incredible view of the lake and the Adirondacks from Burlington, from Church Street, and from the waterfront area would be blocked by these private condo towers that with limited access, with no bike path down there, any of this kind of stuff. And so a bunch of us developed a model and did, you know, very crude, uh, but just developed models of showing what you're talking about possible future. It looks very similar to what we have down there now. Mm. You know, public access, bike paths, walking trail, parks, science centers, you know, things like that. And, and with, we've seen it in this community, how it turned turned the conversation very quickly and what was almost a done deal, which was, was it had been approved at the first level, at the planning commission level, you know, got undone when, when people got, came up got up in arms when they realized that there were alternatives to that that is what they really wanted. Yeah, and they were tangible alternatives. Yeah. Case study. Uh, you're bringing up one other point, and that is the, uh, that's interesting, and it's the conflict in the environmental movement uh, between viewsheds, or about viewsheds, for example, or about renewable energy development on public land. Uh, Secretary Salazar is, is very aggressively looking at renewable energy development at public land. Uh, and some environmental groups uh, have trouble with that because of the habitat and stuff. Uh, so within the green community, we're seeing um, we're seeing divisions that we need to somehow heal, uh, and there will be trade-offs. You know, when you site a wind farm, um, you site it intelligently, but there's trade-offs you know, on view shed and other such things. So um, we're going to have to work that out in the environmental community. I think. Since you have raised the trade-offs, I'm wondering, like. What are the trade-offs between investments in mitigation versus adaptation? Because um, big debate about that. Um, of, uh, apprehension that if we begin to focus on adapting to climate change, we'll stop focusing on preventing it. Uh, that need not be the case. We need to multitask. We need to do both things at once. Because um, there was a study that came out of uh, uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, I think in January, John, you may remember, that said many of the climate impacts that are now in motion will be in motion for the next thousand years. We're going to have to deal with those. And in fact, there are regions of this country and around the world that are going to be harder hit than others and less able to cope than others, and we need to help them. We need to acknowledge that. Appalachia is one of them. But uh, uh, so is, are the countries that are, whose water comes from the Himalayan plateau. I mean, we need to acknowledge those problems uh, and, and help them mitigate them. So I think we need to do both. And mitigation, in my mind, certainly does not imply that we should let climate change go unchecked. And yeah, we can't, because uh, the, you know, there's no way to mitigate what the result will be. Mm -hmm. Happy, happy thought. Can I end on a happier thought? Will someone coach me into a happier thought? I don't know if it's happier or not, but um, you, you made a couple points during the video. One is that we need to do something really damn quick. Yeah. And I think most people here would agree with that. Yeah. And two, that we shouldn't turn to some of these alternative uh, nuclear carbon capture, et cetera, like geoengineering, until we absolutely have to. Um, <coughs> how close are we to absolutely have to, and what do we need to do to get the energy efficiency and cost-effective renewables out there in the, in the scale and, and uh, saturation level that you're talking about? That too, that's part of the picture too. Um, I think in terms of getting the technologies out there, we, ought to, we need to create a stable, uh, sustainable market so that the industries invest in the plant and equipment. Uh, uh, that'll bring the cost down as you achieve economies of production scale, manufacturing scale, uh, and that's what carbon pricing is meant to do, is to create that, that economic plus for renewables and efficiency. We need to do that. Um, the government can help and is helping, in fact, by committing to large-scale purchases of solar, for example, on federal facilities. It can, it, it's a sizable energy consumer and sizable consumer of goods, uh, very sizable. And it, it, it can be a market changer, the federal government can, through its purchasing and procurement policies. And that's especially true of the military, which, by the way, is getting this, finally. There's a danger that, well, we talked about, I think Samir and I talked about this, there's a danger that uh, the military will get involved in the wrong way. But, but they're understanding the vulnerabilities of our defense to, uh, to fossil energy. And uh, there was a report that came out last spring sponsored by the Center for Naval Technologies 
done by a board of retired forest fires who said we need to get off of fossil energy of every kind from every source as fast as we can because it is a national uh, security vulnerability. And they laid that out both in terms of internal military operations and in term of, terms of our economy. And I recommend that report if you haven't seen it. Um, what was the, I'm sorry, what was the first part of your question? Um, how close are we to absolutely have to yeah. look at some of the extreme? We've already crossed that line, like Jonathan Lash. That's why they're embracing things they would not have before. I, I think there's time, but not a lot. I, things like energy efficiency and lots of solar applications are immediately deployable. They're not something we have to wait for. Um, uh, you know, new construction is better than retrofits and all this, but there's a lot we can do immediately that we're not uh, doing. Uh, I think there's still time, but there's not a lot. Uh, I would put it in the scope of five years, you know, to really turn things around before we start resorting to uh, far less good options. That's, I'm not a scientist. That's just a, pulling that out of the air from what I've read. Yes, sir. The happier ending. Uh, in Vermont, we passed a, a feed-in tariff uh, this past uh, spring, the first in the nation for a small state. And, and one of the interesting things is there's a 50 megawatt cap on it, and the utilities fight us tremendously. And, and my feedback to the utilities is, why are you afraid of success? Yeah. And you know, uh, and you talk about localizing and so on. Isn't that really the message? And the, the happy ending is we can do this at the local level and the smaller level instead of relying on the, the global level? Yeah. Um, the, the, the business case is that there are big profits to be made here. As Hunter Logan's like, say the first people of the future are going to be the billionaires of tomorrow. In fact, we already have half a dozen solar billionaires around the world. Uh, there's huge business opportunities here where companies can do good by doing, or do well by doing good. And allowing us to end extreme poverty in ways that don't destroy ecosystems, um, and democratization of power through distributed power is a great thing. Um, saves investment in the grid, saves uh, transmission losses, and there's lots of advantages even to the utility. I think on renewables we're the same place we were when Amory Lovins was talking about megawatts. It seems counterintuitive to the utilities right now, but the fact is in Colorado. For example, we passed the country's first and only citizens' referendum that established a renewable energy portfolio standard um, the opposition of the legislature and XL Energy. And two years later, XL Energy was on the side of doubling that portfolio standard because it was deploying solar so quickly. And now XL Energy is pretty much a believer. It doesn't do everything right. Uh, that's a success story where utilities learned the hard way that th this is good business. This is a good thing to do. Nancy, you had your hand. It's a happy thought department, <laughs> being an incurable optimist. Um, the um, Bill McKibben claims that his October 24th rally uh, for climate action is the largest global political event the world has ever seen. So my point is, people care. You know, everybody does, even supermodels. <laughs> there are so many people who want to know what to do. You know, one of the big criticisms of Al Gore's movie, whether he deserved it or not, was that it didn't tell us enough about what to do. Um, if you if you give people something to do, like Bill McKibben has, you see you see what you're saying. There's a lot of people who want to act on this. You need to need to know how. Yes, sir. Last question, I think. Have you worked with transition town groups anywhere in the world? I mean, because I, I'm excited by what they're talking about, but it's they're dealing in abstract. They're not doing like what your video does in terms of show tangible things that you can bite onto and. Yeah. With them, I'm aware of them. I'm in touch with some of them in, in the UK. Uh, where I'm spending a lot of time lately. Um, I'm sort of in a different space. Um, I like what they're doing, but uh, the space I'm in is more conventional. It's trying to show people how their communities and their lives can be not that sacrificial or not that radically different in terms of quality of life. And, I, and I'm sure that transition people would say the same thing. I, I'm trying to show in more conventional, embraceable ways by the majority of people how they can make this shift. And the transition community movement may be uh, more on the radical side of the shift, if I can use that term. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people who would not embrace that because they can't relate to it well enough. So I'm trying to be in that middle ground where we are getting those kinds of people to relate. Yeah, but I love what they're doing. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. It's been a lot of fun for me.